So how to study a battle. That's our topic today. And one thing I can sort of kick that off with is um, we need to think about why to study a battle. As you proceed through your schooling, uh, military history is, is much neglected these days. Uh, it's something a lot of people do for fun. It's something the US military does professionally. Um, for instance, if you, you know, become a, a NFL quarterback or a brain surgeon or a belly dancer, nobody is going to ask you to do a paper on the great members of that profession from the 1920s or on how things used to be done. It's only the military as a profession, it's only the military that believes that studying its own history still gives vital lessons on how things are done. Uh, a brain surgeon isn't gonna study brain surgery in 600 BC, but a military officer is going to do papers on battles in 600 BC. And the reason for that, uh, in my humble opinion, is that technology changes, but there are some fundamentals of leadership which do not change. And the brain inside a modern Kevlar helmet is just the same as the brain that was inside an ancient brass helmet. And there are some other things that stay stable across history as well. Uh, and we'll hit on a couple of those things today. So we study military history, partly, to understand people under stress. Uh, there's no better way to understand people under stress than millions of case studies of people under stress. And in many ways, that's what, what military history offers. But as far as digging into a specific battle, I really encourage you to take that on as a project this year, uh, someplace in your curriculum. Uh, and give me a holler uh, if you want help picking one or suggestions for sources or even some feedback on a finished project. But if every educated person would pick one battle sometime in history, and study um, the leadership factors, the cause and effect, and, and everything about that battle, um, I, I think that would be a very valuable thing. We often see how unrealistic people's expectations are and their understanding of conflict. It comes from movies. Uh, and they've seen the movie version of Aragorn fighting the orcs. And you have to go beyond entertainment and look at real factors. And to some of us, this comes naturally. Um, you know, you may have a youngster who's already playing with toy soldiers constantly, working out battle tactics, uh, and that's how I got started. Uh, but there's a broader picture there, too. Let's say that you're reading a Jane Austen novel, and the regiment comes to town, a very important occurrence, I believe, in Pride and Prejudice. You're gonna understand that novel better than you did after today, after we get down some fundamentals of uh, military understanding. So this is a highly simplified system of how to look at a battle. I'm gonna recommend some more complicated ones if you wanna dig further. But for now, let me see if I can make my screen sharing work all right. It's not shared yet, is it? Hold on, share screen, here we go, here we go, tremendous. And everybody should be looking at how to study a battle in threes. Now, this is a highly simplified introduction to military knowledge, but I think you're gonna find it very helpful uh, it is mostly centered on the 1700s and the 1800s, the black powder era. 
many of the concepts are going to go way, way back to ancient history and all the way forward to today. But when things are very specific, it's 17 and 1800s that we're mostly talking about. Uh, and one thing that I was taught as a, as a non-commissioned officer years ago, tell people what you're going to tell them and then tell them and then tell them what you just told them. So we're going to go over these simplified things today. Hopefully they'll stick in your head. You may want to take some notes as well. And again, I'm happy to answer questions or, or give reviews by email. But we're going to talk about three what are called arms of service. And you can think of those arms of service as types of soldiers. Hold on one second, folks. Uh, well, I make good and sure no one's left out at the moment. Okay, good. Um, we're going to talk about three sizes of military unit. And that's the one that changes the most over time. So when we talk about a company in 1780, that's not necessarily going to be the same thing as when we talk about a company, you know, in 1980. We're going to talk about three formations, three significant ways that uh, troops can be deployed in battle. And we're going to wrap up with three questions that will help you make sense out of hopefully any battle that you decide to study in depth. Uh, many of the folks here today are from the Columbia area. If you're going to do a battle that you want to visit the terrain of, um, a good place to do that is the Country Creek Heritage Reserve. But proceeding with our lesson, excuse the noise, I'm rolling my computer on a little cart right now to get closer to my special effects for the day. All right, three arms of service or types of soldiers. Now again, to make everything into threes today, I'm leaving some stuff out. I'm leaving out the medical folks, uh, which my parents were in the army. Uh, I'm leaving out the engineers. They're worth a lesson on their own. I'm talking about three arms of service that are known as the combat arms. And these three groups are the infantry, the cavalry, and the artillery. And a few basics about each of these groups uh, that you want to have down as you study any battle. All right, the infantry soldier made up the bulk of the armies. And uh, this is a little talk I give every time I give this lesson because it's important. There's going to be some young men out there listening to this lesson who one day are going to go speak to a recruiter. And what you need to understand is that the infantryman is a foot soldier. He gets around on foot. Today he's got better transportation, but when he gets to the battlefront, he gets off the better transportation and he fights on foot. And he does it with a personal weapon whether that's a spear in the Macedonian phalanx or whether that is a rifle today. An infantry soldier is an up close and personal brown, ground pounder who marches and shoots. The reason I say that, if you talk to a recruiter one day and he implies that the infantry is something other than that, talk to a different recruiter. If you go infantry, go on purpose. I have a blue rope, as they call it, in my own closet. I'm very proud to have uh, done some National Guard infantry. But be aware, the infantry soldier fights personally and up close. He was the most common soldier on these battlefields, and the infantry took the most casualties. Uh, the infantry has a traditional color, and this traditional color would sometimes, there's three traditional colors for each of these groups, and uh, these would go on the trim of your uniform. It wouldn't be the color of the entire uniform, uh, but it would be featured, and it's still featured today in insignia or the rope you get, uh, the, uh, uh, the 
decorative stuff on a dress uniform. Light blue refers to the infantry. The infantry is known for some odd reason as the queen of battle. I suspect that reason is from the chessboard where the queen can move in any direction and is very versatile and powerful and important. So the infantry soldiers march and shoot. All right, the cavalry soldiers. Cavalry soldiers are defined by moving fast. In the 17 and 1800s, that meant on horseback. A cavalry soldier was defined by being a horseman. Now you run backwards to the Middle Ages and the knights uh, in their full armor are heavy cavalry who are very decisive on the battlefield. You move forward to today and when you need troops to move with great mobility, cavalry was redefined in the 20th century as air cavalry carried by helicopters to get where they're going. Uh, or as armored cavalry, using armored vehicles to move fast and have mobility. But the most important defining thing about the cavalry is that they move fast. And two things they use their mobility for are scouting. The guy on horseback can go out and look at what's going on and bring back that information to you. And raiding hitting unexpectedly somewhere behind enemy lines, tearing up a railroad, blowing up a depot, uh, cutting telegraph lines in the 1860s. Um, there were times in history when cavalry also were shock troops on the battlefield. And the traditional color of the cavalry is gold. It, it looks yellow. Don't don't call it yellow, they don't like that. Um, but this, uh, the traditional trim on a cavalry soldier's outfit is uh, a bright yellow, a gold color. Uh, in fact, anybody here who is a fan of um, college sports, when they actually happen, not like this year, uh, might notice the, the Michigan Wolverines colors are blue and uh, they call it maize, but they have a you know, a bright yellowish, goldish color. Those colors are drawn directly from the Union Cavalry of the 1860s uh, when Custer ordered his Michigan Cavalry to charge at Gettysburg. He shouted, come on, you Wolverines. So cavalry are horseback. Cavalry are riders, they move fast. And moving fast is their advantage. Uh, a cavalry leader has to make quick decisions because his advantage is the ability to move fast. So if he chooses instead to be indecisive, a cavalry leader gives away his advantage. So we see the cavalry leaders, that sort of a, a, a lot of romance around the cavalry. Um, they're, they're horseback, they're often um, uh, wealthier people in civilian life sometimes because sometimes they have to provide their own horses. The weapon they're known for is the saber during this time in history. The sword or saber and the trained swordsman and his horse. Those are what today we would call a weapon system. They work together and sabers were the symbol of the cavalry. Um, a saber, in fact, the best definition of a saber as far as I'm concerned is a kind of sword meant to be used from horseback. And then we get to the artillery, the guns. Uh, some of you might be familiar with how the, the military doesn't like a soldier to call a rifle a gun. Uh, and that's, that's really kind of odd. Um, but there actually is a very good reason why at basic training that that drill sergeant is going to holler at you for referring to the weapon you're carrying as a gun. Uh, it seems like one of those dumb things they came up with just to make your life more complicated. It's not. Although the drill sergeant himself probably doesn't know it, the reason he doesn't want you to call a rifle or a pistol a gun is for clear communication on the battlefield. 
when the colonel says, I need guns on that ridge now, and then he turns around to handle one of the 50 other things the colonel's got to handle, and, and then he sees that there's eight guys up there with rifles, that's not what he meant. When he said he wanted guns, he wanted artillery up there. And so to this day, although, you know, you go downtown to the gun show and buy a hunting shotgun, the military has a very strong tradition of not referring to a hand weapon as a gun. Artillery was called the king of battle. Uh, its color was red, uh, perhaps for fire. And uh, a little funny fact about the artillery, they are the one arm of service who have their own patron saint. Once a year, every artillery unit in the Western tradition, in a European or North American country at least, uh, has, a, has a big dinner, their formal dining out, their, their big party night, is the Feast of St. Barbara. Uh, St. Barbara was martyred by explosives. And so she became, in the early days of gunpowder, the patron saint of people who dealt with explosives, including the artillery. So again, those three arms of service. Here we have a picture of the artillery in action, a small, highly trained crew. This is tough work. They're actually going to do slide rule math under fire. Uh, the artillery on the battlefield, um, they consider themselves in the 8, 17 and 1800s sort of a cut above everybody else, more educated. There were men who turned down the chance to be an officer in another unit to be an ordinary soldier in an artillery unit. Uh, that wasn't too unusual. So artillery, their color is red. They cause the most casualties on the battlefield. My goodness, okay, there we go. And um, the artillery is called the king of battle. All right, the cavalry, um, which I, I, one of my little pet peeves here, and you hear it very often, uh, especially here in the South, um, it is a confusion of two different words. Calvary. Calvary is a geographical feature. It is a hill outside Jerusalem. Calvary is a place. Cavalry are the fast moving soldiers on horseback who scout and raid. So we see a couple of uh, cavalry soldiers with their short carbines there, um, actually reenacting cavalry soldiers at the annual Battle of Acre. And back where we started with what in World War I were called the PBI, the poor bloody infantry. The infantry soldier is the man with a rifle wearing boots on the ground who's going to fight up close and personal and there are more casualties from the infantry than anybody else. Their color is light blue. Now, having talked about our kinds of soldiers, we're going to talk about how to place them, how to set them up with three different formations. And to help me today, got some British troops, sort of. Play with the soldiers at your house. Today we're going to show you how to do it right. Now I'm going to do my best to use this computer camera so you all put up with my awkwardness. But here you see we got a line of British troops and it is indeed what is known as a line. Have y'all ever heard the terms the rank and file refers to the ordinary membership of an organization 
And the words come from a military unit is organized when it's standing in a formation in ranks, like the front rank and the rear rank and any ranks in between, and files. And the file is you and the man standing directly behind you. So these guys, I'm going to try to give you a good look at these guys. Get these cavalry soldiers out of the way. Their mobility allows us to do that. Are being positioned in a single rank. One rank, no files. This is the classic British combat formation, the line of battle. Kelsey, is this working? What are you looking at right now? Hmm. Hold on, folks. Boom, there we go. Ha! Ah, is this a little better? Okay. Here we have our classic British line. Let's go ahead and give them a regimental banner while we're at it. I love these little things. So the line formation has one huge advantage. It's got one main purpose. When the men point their weapons, when they direct their muskets, they can all aim them at the same time and give a front of fire out here where everybody can shoot. This is a line formation. It's awkward to control for the officers and the NCOs out there to keep the men straight in line. This takes a lot of training. If you're marching, you want your guys in column. It's easy to do follow the leader. And you can take, oh, you can take a column See, this is why I use the British. I wouldn't want to abuse the Patriots this way. Okay. You can take these guys across a bridge. There's, there's no reason they can't march across a narrow bridge in this formation or down a road. When they are in the line formation, you can't walk across the bridge that way. It's too narrow. Uh, if your line formation is extending out with hundreds of men, what you've got are hundreds of muskets that can all fire in the same direction, but you can't move across a bridge. You can't move down a road. It's not efficient for getting from one place to the other. So moving from column to line uh, was really important for troops. And anyone who does close order drill today learns to march today, including with a marching band. Everything that's, that is used today to get all the instruments pointed in you know, fancy directions and so forth was originally designed to get all the muskets pointing the right way at the right time. So these guys in line cannot necessarily move very efficiently, but they can shoot very efficiently if they're pointed in the right direction. Now, either end of this line is called the flank. And the flank is very important in battle. Let's say these guys are dealing with a gun. We make our gun visible. Bit of a challenge, folks. Okay. Hey. Cannon, let's say we're firing a solid shot in the direction of these soldiers. That solid shot will make a hole in the line. If, however, these grenadiers are so unfortunate as to have the enemy artillery positioned on their flank, 
what will one solid shot do from the flank? It will possibly take out a big chunk as it goes straight down the line. So a line gets your weapons very well arranged, but only in one direction. Whoa. I'm going to get terrible damage there. Fortunately, easily fixed. All right. The same is true not just with cannons, but with another group of troops. These lonely Continentals here. I've only got a couple of them today, and one of them's an officer. But If this band is stationed over here and the line of battle is that way, if they really want to shoot at him, only the first couple of guys can level their muskets. The others are in their own way. So attacking from the flank was very effective. And one of the ways cavalry can use their mobility. They can come hopefully from an unexpected direction. So there's one more formation I hope I can go back to my screen share now. Let's see, and make sure we show everybody else's time too. No, we're going to leave. Okay. Um, so here we go. We're talking, we've been talking about two of the three formations, the column. And here you see men moving miserably but efficiently along in a column that's no wider than a road or a bridge. Column is great for moving fast from one place to another uh, and for using roads. Here we've got some German troops demonstrating the classic line moving forward across the battlefield at the charge. Uh, a charge, by the way, not being running full speed, uh, but rather moving in a way that you all arrive at the same time. But the line of battle. Now, this final formation is called the square and very much a, a trademark almost of the British. The square formation put the men in a, a way that all of their weapons are pointing outward. They're packed closely together. They're defended from every side. Well, the square formation is because of the high mobility of the cavalry. The square formation allows you to protect against attacks from the flank or the back. You can't point all your weapons in the same direction. You're not, you, know, you get maximum firepower with the line. You can't move at, at all. Moving the square was, was a difficult, very slow sort of shuffling. It's not, there's no mobility in the square, but the square was great defense against cavalry. There's a problem here and a very big one. It's a great defense against cavalry and you are thoroughly packed together. In the case of artillery, the square is the worst formation to be in. And battles often involved a, a little bit of, this is a view of a square as well. Uh, I call it a rock, paper, scissors game. What you wanted to do was be in the superior formation and trick the other guy into being the wrong formation. Threaten him with cavalry to get him to form square and he hasn't noticed the artillery you have ready to hit him as soon as he's in the wrong formation. Get him to deploy into line to slow him down so that other forces can move around the flank or catch him in column when he's traveling, catch him by surprise in column, which is a very weak defensive formation uh, with um, cavalry, infantry, or artillery, 
Uh, and small units, a squad of men today with a lot of firepower with our automatic weapons will practice different kinds of line and column to this day that are meant to be able to travel fast but provide some security or to put maximum firepower where they're going. But screen sharing is paused. I just got to get back to it in a minute. But when you're setting up your little guys for practice, this is something to remember. By the way, while we got the little guys out here, might as well show you how to play with them right. So, how far can they shoot? If each of these men is five to six feet tall. This represents, um, you know, every two inches or so, then would represent one, uh, uh, two yards. Okay, so about basically an inch a yard. These smoothbore weapons are accurate out to about a hundred yards. So we tend to, set little soldiers up like this for the final stages of battle, when actually, one, two, three, I'm not gonna be able to get the scale on this, but these guys right here can fire all the way down here. And that cannon, The cannon placed here could hit not just those guys down there, but the front of this building if it was firing to scale. So one thing we often get wrong when we set up little battles with little guys is a completely wrong idea of range. All right. So our rock, paper, scissors of getting in the right formation at the right time and tricking the other fella into being in the wrong formation, uh, the one that we're ready to take on. Let's see. There we go. All right, three unit sizes. I, I had to cheat a little bit on this one as far as the threes. Uh, the company. Think of having company over for dinner. Uh, it's not that small of a unit, but your company, if you were in it, are gonna be the guys you have dinner with. In the 17 and 1800s, you can figure a company normally is about 100 men, about 100 guys commanded by a captain. Uh, so, you know, you can think of the, the century and the centurion and the old Roman army, but a company was about 100 guys commanded by a captain. Come in here to the museum, we'll show you some wonderful company flags, usually made by the ladies of one hometown that all the men in that company were drawn from. Okay, moving up, the battalion and or the regiment is a group of companies. The simplest thing to remember, but not always correct, is a regiment made of 10 companies or about a thousand men. Sometimes uh, the French used battalions that were put together into regiments. In South Carolina, it was usually one or the other. If you had eight companies formed into a unit, that was a battalion. If you had 10, it was a regiment. But the battalion of the regiment is an intermediate size. The regiment is the one gonna be seen most often and most important in battle history usually, and it's commanded by a colonel. So a captain commands a company, a colonel commands a regiment. A hundred men in a company, 10 companies in a regiment. Now, that's a rule of thumb. When you're looking at the specific battle, you'll have to look more closely. And by the way, they're very different today. All right, a brigade is a group of regiments. Um, 
In the Confederate Army in the 1860s, uh, five or six. Uh, the brigade is also going to vary in size, but the brigade is big enough that its commander is a general. In fact, a general with one star on his collar, the lowest ranking general, is called a brigadier general. So that gives away the whole game. A brigadier general commands a brigade. All right. So we talked about unit sizes. We talked about three different kinds of troops. Uh, and we talked about three different formations that troops can be in. Uh, now we're going to begin to talk about how do you look at a specific battle and draw some conclusions about it. Um, I, I recommend it already if you want to tackle it during the year. Um, you know, dig into a specific battle. Uh, a interesting way to do that is with a good quality strategy game. And a bunch of those are free at a place called juniorgeneral.org. Um, you can print off the pieces that you need, set up the battleground. And the best part about juniorgeneral.org is that it's actually meant to have uh, lessons. It's, it's meant to teach these things as lessons. So that's a good way to go over it. So if we're looking at any particular battle, here are three questions to ask that are important to understanding it. First question, who is on offense and who is on defense? Now, this is not about who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. Uh, this is about understanding how the battle works. So, you know, maybe the British are far from home in foreign territory. That doesn't mean they're on the offense in a particular battle. If, you know, the British have traveled all the way to South Africa and they're being attacked by the Zulus, the British aren't on offense just because they're the ones in a foreign country. If the British are the ones in a fort being attacked, they're the ones on the defense. This is important because, especially in the 17 and 1800s, but really across time, there's, there's a huge advantage to being the defender. So um, I believe that General Longstreet had written a book in which he said the attacker should have an eight to one advantage in numbers before attacking. So you need that much more strength to make up if the enemy has fortified. If he's, if he's dug holes for his riflemen uh, and taken cover behind stone fences, if he was on the ground first and got ready to be waiting for you and you have to move toward him, uh, then being on defense is a huge advantage. So you have to, to understand a battle, understand who's on offense and who's on defense. Now, there's also uh, the question, what were the holding and the hitting elements of the plan? Most battle plans involve doing something to make the enemy hold still and whacking him from some other direction. So if there's two parts of the plan, one part is made to get the enemy's attention or to get him to move in a direction or to keep him from moving in a different direction. At Fredericksburg, the men who are moving toward the stone wall, they're not, they're not doing this head on crash because that's what they think will win. They're doing a head on crash to keep the rifles aimed toward them as another column comes from the side. So the men are the holding element and the other guys coming around the side were the hitting element. So look for those two things. They're in most battle plans, holding and hitting. Stealing this, by the way, from a uh, Marine Corps officer that gave part of that lecture to me. Dramatic pause for before the third question. What happened when the plan went wrong? So, what are we doing here? Yeah. 
what are we looking at right now? Me or the slide? I guess it doesn't matter too much for this part. Uh, the plan always goes wrong. You will find a, a minuscule number of battles in which, okay, I've decided to study the, the battle of such and such in 1571, and I find out, okay, who's on the defense? Okay, this group of knights is on the defense. Uh, this group of, uh, of um, moors is on the offense. That's important. The knights have an advantage. Then I look, okay, what's the battle plan? Well, the battle plan was to send engineers to blow something up to get their attention while a war galley dropped them off, uh, dropped off another force to attack them from the flank. Okay, so now we have the holding and the hitting elements. Then, what happened when it went wrong? The galley didn't arrive on time, or the mine didn't blow up, or somebody spotted the galley coming and realized they should ignore the distraction and set an ambush. Something changed. Something always changes. Something always goes wrong with the plan. So the critical question to evaluating the battle is, then what happened after what the commander was expecting it went wrong. Who adjusted faster? Uh, and this is an important question. And with those three questions, you can often get a pretty good picture, a lot to think about, about a particular battle. Now, those of you that want to tackle in more depth, uh, and I do hope now that you're looking at a screen share. Um, the military has a term uh, they call COCO. And when they are evaluating a battle, they're going to look for these elements. And the National Park Service uses this now too in their battle lessons. Uh, key terrain features of the ground itself. The ground is, is very important. It's the environment where you fight. Uh, and it, it changes how things are done. Observation and fields of fire. If you go out to Congaree Creek, um, it'll be a little confusing what the battle was like because a lot of plant growth has grown up since 1865 and places that were clear back then to see and to shoot are now dense. It's hard to understand what was going on until you realize that. Cover and concealment. Where can you hide? Where can you be protected from fire? Obstacles. At Congaree Creek, they built things to slow down the Union's approach to the bridge, which was the key terrain feature. And avenues of approach. What, what ways was it possible for troops to move? Which ones could they use? Uh, again, for your older students who want to tackle a battle, that is a good way to do it. But for now, remember I mentioned that Jane Austen book and how you would understand it a little bit better? Well, what we're going to do for the next little bit uh, is go over some questions. And uh, from a theoretical scenario here, I call it the adventures of Lucretia. She's a young lady in South Carolina in the year 1860. And we're going to see if what we've learned today can help her solve some important problems. Um, and fortunately for Miss Lucretia, she is not in the middle of a battle. Um, so folks, I, I, actually, this would be a great time to use chat for answering because nobody else will see your answers. Um, uh, so you can each come to conclusions about this. But um, there's a there's a giveaway in each question that helps you answer it from what you learned today. Number one, Lucretia Longley is a young South Carolina lady in 1860. On behalf of the ladies of her town, she has been selected to present a new silk flag to the commander of her local militia company, the Milford Rifles. Now, giving a flag was a big deal 
The young lady selected to present the flag to a unit gave a little speech. Uh, they didn't have a homecoming queen back then, but that's sort of who it tended to be. It would be, uh, she'd be young, pretty, single, and she would usually um, be the daughter of, of somebody important, maybe an officer in the unit. Uh, and it was something you didn't want to mess up. If, if you're going to present this flag, this is an occasion. It's going to be in the newspaper. They're going to write about it. And you can look up speeches people made when flags were presented to local companies. So she's concerned because she has no idea who the commander of the unit is. Uh, she has been introduced to Sergeant Shaw, Captain Davis, Lieutenant Holligan, and General Deerfield. They're all present at this ceremony. And she has no idea which one is the commander of the local militia company, the Milford Rifles. Which one of those guys is the commander? Again, there is Sergeant Shaw, Captain Davis, Lieutenant Holligan, and General Deerfield. I have an answer. I'm waiting to see if there are more suggestions. Right, General Davis is the highest ranking man present. And he commands a brigade somewhere. The commander of the local militia unit is Captain Davis. And that better be the guy that she presents the flag to. All right, so we've gotten her through the first of her perils. But later, at a military ball, Lucretia needs to deliver a message to her cousin, Esmeralda. And knowing Esmeralda, she will be trying to impress the highest ranking officer in the room. So if Lucretia is in a hurry to find her, should she look for her with the commander of the 3rd Battalion, the commander of the 10th Regiment, or with Captain Davis, the commander of the Milford Rifles? It should be with a regimental commander, a battalion commander, or a company commander. Now we'll assume Esmeralda herself has done her homework because she's ambitious. Can you see, by the way, how this might be important in the plot of a book? When the names of units just sort of float by and ranks do too, if you're not sure, it can make a difference. All right, I have two correct comments. Yes, she's going to track down the regimental commander. He is a colonel. The battalion commander is probably a major. And of course, we already know about Captain Davis. All right, now a personal trouble for poor Lucretia. Um, and that is that war is impending. Secession has happened. And these troops are going to go into danger. And she has a brother. And her brother, Jonathan, um, takes, her, takes her point of view very seriously. And Jonathan is contemplating different positions he's been offered in the army. Now, Lucretia cares about one thing. Lucretia wants her brother to come back safe when all the shooting is over. She can't tell him that. She has to make up a different reason. But if she's trying to keep him safe, which job that he's been offered should he take? He's been offered uh, that he would make a fine infantry officer because of his leadership skills. He could become a lieutenant. He could go into the artillery uh, because he's skilled with arithmetic and an artillery uh, battery is, is trying to get him to come on board. Or should Lucretia recommend that um, he, he just not take a rifle and rather just carry the regimental flag? Which option should she pick if all she cares about is him coming back? We have more than one suggestion. Well, nobody's falling for that flag bait, and that's good. 
That's good. Today, color guard is a wonderful, wonderful ceremonial job. Uh, to carry the flag in a parade or something like that is great. A color guard on a 18th century or 19th century battlefield could be extremely deadly. Uh, when you come to the relic room in person, remember to see the flag of the first South Carolina regiment that had five teenagers shot carrying it in one battle at Gaines Mill. So carrying the colors, carrying the regimental flag was a deadly, deadly job. The job of an infantry officer was also an extremely deadly job. Um, at Gettysburg, one third of Confederate privates were killed or wounded. One third of Confederate brigadier generals were killed. And the casualty rates for captains and lieutenants were even higher. Uh, an infantry officer was a big time uh, target on the battlefield. So it's not safe to fight at an artillery position, far from it. But if he's going to pick a combat arms job from those three offers, you all are right that said the artillery is the place that she should advise him to go. All right. She delivers her advice. And now uh, she meets, remember, Jonathan, her brother there, uh, it just so happens he is engaged to be married. Uh, and he leaves for his training and Margaret, the fiance, comes to her and says that she wants to trim her new blouse uh, and her new skirt to match Jonathan's uniform. But he hasn't been issued an, uh, a uniform yet, but she wants to surprise him. Next time she comes home, he comes home, uh, you know, that, that she wants to show up in a Vivian Dier outfit, dressed based on a uniform, and she wants it to match his. What color should she have the trim in her outfit done in? Red. And come to the museum, we'll show you an example of a lady who's done up her outfit to stand next to somebody else, you know, boyfriend, father, whoever it is, but her Vivian Gare style dress is trimmed collar and cuffs and sash in red to match the artillery. Remember, we had three colors that were the symbolic colors of these units. Sometimes you even had hats of this color. Um, Jonathan might get a, a red kepi because he's in the artillery. Um, red for artillery, light blue for infantry, and gold or yellow for cavalry. All right. At the ball, Lucretia was impressed by a young enlisted soldier named James. Even though he tripped on his saber several times. She would like to accidentally meet him again, if possible, uh, and she needs a, a, a plan for that. She has no idea what regiment he's part of. She's still a beginner at this stuff. Does she have a better chance of finding James by bringing a basket of fried chicken to that artillery camp or delivering a package from the Ladies Aid Society to the Milford Rifles, who of course are infantry, or riding along with her father to supply horseshoes to the cavalry camp. She wants to meet young James, an enlisted soldier, a bit clumsy, he tripped over his saber, but she likes him, where should she go? Now, there's a, a critical detail here in this little puzzle. And that is the fact I did say James was enlisted because an officer from any of those units would likely have a saber, but only in the cavalry would an ordinary enlisted soldier have a saber, which is to this day the symbol of cavalry. So those who are interested, I have five more questions you can you know, email me to send you. Uh, they don't involve Lucretia. Instead, they are questions for uh, somebody who might be on a battlefield um, of his own volition. Uh, they're more soldier questions, uh, but they will let you 
test a little bit of the knowledge that you got today. 